I would love to to experience a dish that, just to give you an example, we've all experienced bitterness, sure, or whatever. You know, somebody betrays us, somebody, you know, somebody, you know, disillusions us, and, mm-hmm. and there's that tang of bitterness. But what? How could a how could a dish capture remembered bitterness? When you remember a bitterness that you're no longer experiencing. How, you know, like we've all had those moments and then we, we transcend them, we, we get, go on, and then at some point you remember that broken heart, that disillusionment. Right. Now, remembering an emotion automatically means that you're reflecting on it. So art in its highest form is a reflection on emotion and ideas combined. Mm-hmm. So that's what really sets it off. That's what enables it to be ambiguous. That's what enables it to combine the pool of emotions we all feel through this filter that has that is reflecting on it in a different way than perhaps we were expecting. <laughs> We start now. We've started Boom. four minutes ago. So <laughs> you are listening to Bang Kong Podcast. This is already all of the train wreck that we usually are on this podcast. Oh, man, but so much uh, more. But so much more. So and, much more pressure. And in such a different setting. Oh, God. This time around, of course, I am joined by oh. chef and chili cook-off champion Michael Bedrang. Only one time. Only one chili cook-off championship, but it, it still counts. Once a chili cook-off champion, always a chili, chili cook-off champion. Blah, blah, blah. Chili cook-off champion. Uh, we are recording today at the home of one Ricardo Pau Llosa. Uh, and I will do a little bit of an introduction here of who Ricardo is. Ricardo, uh, we'll go into more depth on your biography. Uh, but just, you know, what you do and what the hell we're even doing here. Uh, but you and I met through the uh, Belen Alumni Association. Right. Uh, I think oh, finally we're, we're I, overpowering. Him. I think it was just Three that one I think time. it was just that it came up in a in a meeting of a thing that I worked at a cigar magazine and you immediately wanted to know whether I had any for you. Uh, <laughs> and then we became friends that way. That's amazing. <laughs> That's basically what That's happened. That's good. Yeah, we were so the only said no, I immediately turned around and started talking to other people. Yeah, pull pull the microphone closer to yourself. You yeah. when you're talking you want to be pretty yeah, I do. I want to be right exactly. up here. Right, yes, right. Thank you. So, um uh Ricardo and I'm, I'm not even going to try to figure out the chronology because there's a lot of things, but you are a, a poet, you are an art critic, you are, uh, I don't know that I've ever heard you put it this way, but certainly other people have put it and written about it this way, one of the more consequential critics of Latin American art. Um, there's a lot of cool shit here that is here because crazy. people have recognized that and you've you know developed a, 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 an incredible network of of artists and poets and people uh, who respect you. One of the reasons that I've been pushing so hard to make this podcast happen, and I was actually telling Mike while, Ricardo, you were in the bathroom, uh, that uh, you recently told me that you write Cuban poetry in English. And as soon as you said that, I thought of Mike and his approach to food, where he's taking Cuban food and Cuban culture and uh, applying, I don't know if you'd say applying it to Mike or applying to it uh, French technique and classical food ideas. Uh, and maybe there's a little bit of to it and... Yeah, you know. I mean, there's uh, like... And there's, by the way, this is this is where I'll step out. And yeah, just, no. Yeah. You'll step in and out. That's what Nick does. Whatever. He steps in and out of shit the whole time. So oh, I, I think the the approach I have to food is something that, since I am Cuban American, born in Hialeah, and of Cuban parents, my I feel like my goal in life is to keep our our tradition, mm-hmm. our culture, our being alive through my food, and it doesn't need to be like rice and beans, well, and it doesn't need to be so many things that people think that we are. Uh, just because they think that we are those things doesn't mean I need to be those things. I need to be who I am, and. Through that extension, who I am is Cuban American. So that relates to the plate, and it could be, you know, there's it could be so many things. You know, our foie gras dish I feel like is the most representation of like Cuban American culture and like the 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 combination of that. And I think that through 
Oh yeah, that's good. Was it good? It was incredible. It was my first time having foie gras. Really? Oh, first time having foie gras. And that dish. It's a very introductory version it of foie gras for like a diner, and I think through as time developed, I kind of gained my voice and I gained confidence in myself and in my food because I I I understood the journey a little bit better. And the journey will change, you know. I think all of our journeys change and things uh, adjust, and you kind of learn uh, at least every day a little bit more of what you want your purpose to be. And I mean, I'm 35, so I feel like my purpose at 35 and my purpose at 45 will be different. So yeah, I mean, that's the extension of like, um, when he mentioned that quickly to me a couple of minutes ago of, you know, you write your poetry in English, it makes sense to me. I try to relate um, Cuban food to what the everyday diner wants but if they really were to think about it, there's more to the story. You know, the foie gras dish started because sour orange is something that we use a lot. And we only use it for one application, but it can be used for more things. And it was inspired by the tree that was in my grandparents' backyard that's still in my grandparents' backyard. And that's where it all started. The first time I made the dish was with the sour oranges from the tree and so on and so forth. And... And then now it's been on the menu for five years and it was created eight years ago. Love it. So, well, yeah. One of the things that's always fascinated, uh, well, not just me, many people, is the how tastes and smells trigger memories. Oh, yeah. In a way that visual and audile stimulus doesn't quite do it in the same way. Right. Um, you know... You you taste something and it stays in there, and then thirty years later, you taste this this thing. For instance, I have this fixation with coming up with the same maltia that I had as oh, a yeah. kid in El Tenseng in La Habana, right. in Galeano y San Rafael, and they had these they would put them in these like paper cone uh, things, you know, with a plastic stand, but the the taste of the malteada was like I've and I've tried every combination to try to adjust it. It when I get that malteada taste again, I'll probably you know go into some kind of uh, transcendental state. Um, the same thing with 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 aromas. Um, as a as a kid, I was my godfather who was. Uh, worked in in Partagas and he he would he would put, I spent Saturdays with him and we would go we filled up his his pisicorre his station wagon with boxes of cigars and he would take them to different points in Havana and I remembered that smell of those those the cedar boxes and the tobacco so at some point when I was a young man I just felt when I lit my first cigar and opened my first cigar box I I was transported right. so food i think that's why food uh, has such a powerful role in the preserver and the transmission of a culture's living developing mm. identity right because it's it's very intimate it's it's of the, of the the senses of smell and taste have to actually hit the body i mean mm. it's not like you can see something from afar i guess you could smell something from a certain distance but that the whole idea that the tongue has to actually receive the palate has to receive that food that it triggers those memories and that's why it has that role every every ethnic group that comes to a new society food is the first thing that gets established and then later innovators like yourself continue that tradition and 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 evolve it that's that's how you can tell it's a living culture otherwise mm -hmm. we'd be eating frijoles negros and rice for a hundred million years right and it would be just a nostalgia taste as opposed to or an anchoring taste as opposed to a developing mm -hmm. culture that has new tastes with the, within a tradition mm -hmm. so i think that that's important something i i um, before we like dive into i mean the first thing you mentioned to me when i walked into your house was that you've been collecting art since you left belen so that's been a long time. We're going to dive into that. But the something I want to touch on, because I've never actually spoken to someone that critiques art, mm -hmm. right? And someone that knows as knows art the way that you do. 
Never in my life have I spoken to someone that has that kind of knowledge. The The food world always has this fine line of like art versus craft, right? Like food is in essence a craft. I think that we have to take years to learn the craft and to understand the craft and then to apply the craft the way that we want to. And then when you learn that craft and you apply it, is that your version of art? It depends because there's different layers and levels of food, you know, um, and there's different approaches to food, whether it's like a little more sterile is what I say, or it's a little more, um, I think what I say is vivid, you know, like I think vivid food has more green tones to it. It has things that evoke automatic response to the eye. Maybe not to the nose, maybe not to the palate, but like when you see it, it's like, wow, that's beautiful. And it could be like stuff that's sterile. When I look at like Alinea, which is what people feel is one of the top 10 restaurants in the world, which it is, um, their approach is a little more sterile. It could be one simple thing on a dish with uh, several layers to it, complexity-wise, flavor-wise, but the art is in the simplicity of it. So we go through this several times of like, are, are we artists or are we craftsmen? I feel like we're a combination of both. And I feel mm -hmm. like to be a good artist, you need to be a combination of both. Mm -hmm. I never taught myself as an artist. I feel like, you know, for something to live, like stuff like this, to live on forever. I mean, these things live forever. They could live for thousands of years, like the spoon you just showed me mm -hmm. 20 minutes ago. Um, there's power in that. Mine, I need to be able to execute that 45 to 50 times in a night and make sure it tastes good. It smells good. It's hot. And that, uh, it still is stimulating to the eye at the same time. Good. So do you consider food a form of art? And when you consume food, do you critique it in the same way that you would consume a piece of artwork? Well, um, it, I think that, High cuisine, like what you do, can can be seen as a as a very creative and as a very artistic form of expression. And uh, however, the the way that you would approach it and critique it, as you say, you know, it's, it's very different. Obviously, we're dealing with with something that ultimately has to satisfy, but also intrigue. It has all the elements of, of like a good poem or yeah. a good or a good uh, painting or a good piece of music. It establishes certain um, presuppositions, things that you expect. But then, as you as you start experiencing the the food or the cigar or the whatever, it it if it's good, if it's if it's been created with artistry. It will change. It will alter your expectations, broaden them, alter them, sabotage them, interrogate them, do all the things that a work of art should do with a subject matter. Otherwise, then you've got nothing but craft. If you there are paintings which are very crafted, somebody who has gone to art school has learned how to execute X, Y, and Z things and can do them flawlessly. Right. But they're dead. They're dead because they don't. They don't set up a chain reaction that the artist or the chef um, triggers and maybe thinks it will evolve in this way, but, that, but the experience of it is very private. Right. The same thing with a painting or with a poem. I write poetry and then people sometimes write reviews of my books and they comment on it. I go, oh my God, this is, I never thought that it was going in that direction. It fascinates me that the that the critic is in, is digesting this in a very different way mm. and that is proof of of the vitality of what you you are producing the the artists the creators plan for this thing whatever that is is only one voice among many everyone who experiences that dish or that poem or that movie or whatever is it has a it comes with a subjective history and a set of expectations that are very different, and you want that to happen. You mm -hmm. you don't want everybody to come away with the same response because otherwise, then that is that's what when it's not a work of art, right? It's the ambiguity is what makes it a work of art, right? It's your voice, 
It's what, what it, are you trying to evoke an emotion? For me, I feel like the food that makes me wake up every day is the one that I want someone to feel emotionally involved. And that's not the same with every diner. And I'm sure it's not the same with every person that consumes art. Right. right. That's true. Uh, what I want is what you were talking about is like something that to remind me of a moment, to remind me of a situation, of a time, of a, a moment in my life that meant something. And for me, food relates that, you know, and, and you know, we have to break it down to uh, efficiency standpoints and business standpoints. And, sure. you know, I mean, I run a business at the end of the day, but it's, I'm emotionally involved. And that's why it, it's very hard for me, like it, people, like you said, people that uh, buy your books and then they read your poetry and then they comment on it. I don't read the comments because for me, I don't want the comments to affect my uh, relationship I have with my food. You know, it's like I, I want I want my food to be a pure extension of like my thought process, you know, and I want it. Whether people get it or not, because I, I would honestly say 9.5 times out of 10, they don't get it. And that's fine. I've accepted that. It's more like that is the real goal, you know. And, and I feel like when I look at all these things, all, uh, I mean, this room is overwhelming. The house is overwhelming, you know. When you look at all these things, there's four people in this room and every single piece in here can mean something different to every single person in here. And will mean something different every time they come in here and see them. Right. But this is the thing. For me, a work of art, not just again for me, but for, for you know, critics in general, it isn't just the emotion. It is what the artist knows about the emotion. Because an emotion, we all have actually the same emotions, basically. We have a repertoire of emotions that are very similar. Right. But what distinguishes something unique is and transcendent is the reflection on that emotion. So, for instance, if I were a chef, mm -hmm. and maybe you've thought in this term as well, I'm, I'm not just, I wouldn't just be co combining these, these, what happened? No, I'm refilling. Oh, this okay, got straight, it. This is like we went to yes. the gas station and we refilled. All right, there you go. Yeah. I would, for instance, I would, I would love to to experience a dish that, just to give you an example, we've all experienced bitterness, sure, or whatever you know, somebody betrays us, somebody, you know, somebody you know disillusions us, and, mm -hmm. and there's that tang of bitterness. But what? How can a how can a dish capture remembered bitterness when you remember? A bitterness that you're no longer experiencing how you know like we've all had those moments and then we we transcend them we we get go on and then at some point you remember that broken heart that disillusionment right now remembering an emotion automatically means that you're reflecting on it so art in its highest form is a reflection on emotion and ideas combined Mm -hmm. So that's what really sets it off. That's what enables it to be ambiguous. That's what enables it to combine the pool of emotions we all feel through this filter that has that is reflecting on it in a different way than perhaps we were expecting. Mm. And it's what we know about that emotion and how it gets transmitted in the theater of your of your dish. In the in the theater, which isn't just visual, but it's the way that those tastes combine and form a narrative that that makes it that would make it completely you know unique and, and i i experienced that with great food yeah let me ask you like oftentimes when i talk about the direction and the i i think the long term of my food and i and i, I keep on going into this like my food because i feel like talking to someone that is that critiques art for a living Food is uh, a, it is a form of craft and art together, right? So, yeah. is the artist trying to convey a conversation that they've had with themselves to you, as someone that is critiquing or someone that's consuming their art? Not 
literal. You're not consuming it literally. You're consuming it. They're experiencing it. Right. For me, it's consumption. And that's why I always say, like, you're you're consuming my, what I feel like is a conversation that I've had either with myself or with people, you know, and it's, uh, and it always goes back to like the Cuba thing, right? Cause being, uh, Cuban American born here family, like, uh, we want to keep our thing alive. And that's why I feel like the conversation is so important. And I feel like it's like, um, I want to tell people, my feelings that I have for my people that we are a lost group of children. I think we are a lost group of people. Everyone wants us to get the venti latte when we really want just a cotadito at the end of the day, you know, like that's who we are. And I think as much as they try to push their dynamic on us, we will, I mean, we made a city for ourselves because that's what Miami is at the end of the day. Um, do you feel like when you sit there and you look at a piece of art, are you consuming it? Are you experiencing it? And then when you go to dine, like you did a couple hours ago, are you, is it just consumption or are you experiencing it at the same time? And it, I know that you are experiencing it in theory, but uh, in your brain, is it both? Yeah, it, it, for me it is. I don't know, you know, all, all diners approach it in the same way. Maybe they're just looking for a combination of flavors they've never quite experienced in that way and right. they want to be titillated and, and, and you know, given some sort of a, a stimulus that they that they were, you know, that they're grateful to have. Right. For me, it's more complex, but for me, everything is more complex. I mean, it's just because I'm an artist and I'm a writer and that's how I live. So, um, the... The conversation that the artist is having with the viewer or the consumer is is different because, and now I, I'm talking as a, as an artist myself, as a writer. You don't think about other people when you're writing. You have a conversation with your craft, with your tradition. I write sonnets. For the last five years, I've been writing practically nothing but sonnets. Elizabethan sonnets, Petrarchan sonnets. Uh, I've been hooked on rhyme forms now for quite a while. First part of my career, I was doing mostly free verse, and now I, I do almost completely formal verse. And I'm in a, I'm, just by writing, I'm in a conversation with that tradition with what other sonneteers have done with a similar theme or with a similar image and how I'm, I'm altering it. But you're, you're having that conversation with, with your tradition, which the consumer, to use your word, is overhearing. Your consumer is overhearing your conversation with your art. Basically, you're saying they're just in the room. But you wouldn't be writing it or or making the dish or creating whatever if they weren't in the room. Right. But the conversation isn't with them. The conversation is, in my case, as a poet, is with my tradition. And, and you know, I'm talking to all these people who wrote sure. sonnets. And, and I'm throwing my hat in the ring on that particular subject. And sometimes I'm making fun of the of the of the past, and sometimes I'm paying homage to it, and sometimes I'm just doing my own thing. But from the moment that I'm writing a poem in any form, I'm I'm engaging a tradition, and I'm conversing with it, and I'm and I'm I'm shaping the way we can reflect on it. So hopefully, but the reader, the experiencer, the consumer is in the room. Very important that they're in the room, of course. But we need them in the room. But when you're writing, when you're creating, I at least don't think of the other person in the room. Mm. They're there. And at the end of the day, when I send my work out to be published, obviously I'm interested in people reading my work because I, I publish in many different magazines and I publish books. So it's not like I'm writing and then, you know, hiding them somewhere. It's not just for me. No, I want it out there. Mm. But at the moment when I'm creating, I'm not thinking about who's going to read it or right. how or if, for that matter. I'm, I'm, I'm talking because there's a part of us which is the creative personality. Mm. See, you're many different Michaels and I'm many different Ricardos. 
you are not the same Michael when you're creating a new dish as you are when you're figuring out what you said. How do I, you know, make this business work and right, profitable? Right, right. Yeah, it's a different hat. And how do I, well, who's the Michael that then is the friend of so-and-so or the husband of so-and-so or the father of or the yeah. brother or the this or the that or the political entity or the fill in all the blanks? Each one of those is a different facet of us. Mm. And the artist is a different facet of us too. That's why you can... As an artist, artists can create things, and, and it's usually that's how it works, that is not the emotion they're experiencing at that moment. Mm -hmm. I can write a poem about, I don't know, anger, and hopefully I'm not angry when I'm writing it, right. because then it's going to be a lousy poem about anger. It's better to reflect on that emotion, and, and, and then I've systematized it, and now I'm writing from a different perspective on it. Um, so the the artist will think and feel things that the rest of us of who you are may not even agree with right may not feel, even agree I with i feel that 100 percent. right so that's when you know that you're dealing with a real artistic creation let me ask you so um in that moment of creation mm -hmm. and and i and i it's tough because it you just going back to what you said like 30 seconds ago, you wear several hats, you know, and you're in, you are several versions of yourself in that moment and you act a certain way in that moment. And that moment of creation, I feel like is very pure. I feel like it is that, that person that it is that child inside of you that is uh, the one that is always fighting to get out. I All feel. Right. So for me personally, uh, in the role that I, I have, which is several versions of like the business owner, the operator, the boss, the best friend, the person for you to talk to. And then you have that one moment of creation, which <clears throat> sometimes is rarer than others. Because when you have that pure moment of creation, it is like it's it's almost like it's new every single time, I feel. Because people ask me, it's like, so what do you do to get in the mood to come up with new food? I'm like, I don't fucking know. Like, it's fucking different every time. There's only one answer. I live. That's true. That's it. But, but living is, it's, it's interesting because we live this monotonous life right now, especially this year, right? This year, it's always, it's all about like fear and what's happening and should I be scared and should I be worried about what's happening tomorrow and next week mm -hmm. and how are we going to pay these bills? And then you have this like, uh, I, I, I came up with a new dish today and I came over and I showed it to Nick. And the reason why it showed me so much was because I was in, I was alone in a room and I simply just looked around myself and thought to myself, what was the best thing to do right now? You can't sit in a room like, you know, because I have an office and I never had an office in my life and I have an office now. And I, you can't sit in an office and think about food wise, what's going to connect the best. Mm -hmm. You can only be around the food and right. connect it all. Sure. So in that moment, I was like, well, you know, I looked around and Guava George, which is a legend in Miami, uh, had given us some plantains and I was like, well, we have these and we have that and we have this and let's just put it all together. And I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was something that I was like, wow, this is probably one of the better dishes I've ever created. And it was through so much garbage, like of the day, like so many clouds to fight through, to find that creation moment. I feel like is what really dictates a true artist. You know, like, because they have to fight through so many personal battles and so many demons of whatever they live through. And you see it in their art. You see it in their moment. For food, I don't think it relates the same way. Because food, people consume, they eat, it satisfies them. They go home and they go to sleep. This art lives up on a wall forever. And I, I, I often wonder to myself, 
is there going to be a moment in 20 or 30 years that people are like, man, that dish at that moment really spoke to me? I, I, I won't know until that time. But it's interesting to talk about like the art world and the food world and how they coexist, but they fight each other at the same time. You use the word beauty, and that's, I think, the crux. Um, beauty can be experienced in so many different ways. In tastes and smells and in images and in, in words on a page. And beauty, as Robert Frost once was asked, you know, what is a poem? And his response was, a poem is news that stays news. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So it's something new and it stays new. We can still stand in front of Renaissance masters. You can stand in front of a Velasquez painting. You can listen to, you know, Bach or, you know, whoever, Verdi. And they're still fresh. They're still new. Yeah. They're new because every, and you can see the same play a hundred times, or you read the same poem any number of times, or the same movie. And it has a new dimension because you're experiencing it from jump, even though you've already experienced it many times. And, and you discover things in yourself and in the piece that make it new right now. And it will be new if it's a real work of art. Now, in terms of the, the culinary arts, the dish emerges if you're you're creating these dishes because they're emerging out of a tradition that you're that you are working with and innovating and and using it as as a language but the, the language of poetry is is the language everybody uses but the poet uses it in a different way right. that's what makes it a poem and you're you're you know it's not just that you're throwing ingredients together and da da because it, in the same way a poem isn't just a bunch of words thrown together, well, some poems nowadays are like a bunch of words thrown together, but let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> so is food. It's a bunch of shit on a plate right. that's just thrown together. So I feel you. Right. But when you're talking about beauty, when, when you can walk away from the experience that you've experienced something timeless, meaningful, alive, mm. alive in the sense that it also escaped from the artist's intention. Yeah, it was you too know? much for them even at the moment. Yeah, because imagine if you pulled Shakespeare out of the grave and, and then hit him with, let's say, everything Freud and everyone else has said about his work, he'd probably have a heart attack and plop right back in. Right. Right? Because culture grows and its appreciation of the artwork changes. So now the artist is aware of that in a, just in a basic way and not aware of what will how it will live in the future. Mm -hmm. And, and this is just like a, uh, an effect of the creative process that the artist can't control, can't predict, can't navigate, can't pilot. You can only more or less talk to the past, redirect it in the present, and set it free. And if it's beauty, it is timeless. Yeah, I mean, I feel a lot of that um, that timeless escaping the actual artist at the moment with music. You know, like, there's a lot of musicians I feel like they don't know, like, Sentimental Mood by Coltrane. Right? Like, that... The, In the, a sentimental mood? Yeah. I mean, that whole album, was that Ellington? Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington. With, with Coltrane. That whole album, for me... I don't know if when they did that, they realized the impact it would have on people forever. Like today, I had a shit day. I went into my office and I put that album on blast to try to bring my equilibrium back, to make me uh, feel normal again. Those guys at that moment didn't know that a 35-year-old kid in Miami, Florida was going to have to have that at that moment right. to feel some kind of way again. And I think that's what true art is. Right. It's further than what they could reach at the moment. 
And I, I worry that maybe the conversation I want to have with people is outside of my own reach when it comes artistically or when it comes conversationally or when, you know, like the whole aspect of, uh, we are trying to keep our culture. I don't think relevant is a good word because I don't care about relevance. I think that our culture is important and I think that it matters so much in a larger scheme of things. Of course it matters. And the culture you're trying to, to do this with is, has always been a vibrant growing culture. Cuba wasn't stuck in a, in a rut for 300 years. And then now, because we're a diasporic community and scattered all over the world, we now are exposed to other things. And then we're trying to mix them up with these things so that the thing will live on. No, Cuba was an eclectic culture. It was a world unto itself in many ways. And, and we set the tone. I feel like we set the tone for so many things. Right. It was a, the first truly modern Latin American culture. It was... It had all of these different facets. It was, it was always looking to the future. It, it imported ideas and styles and immediately Cubanized them and turned them into something different. Right. Someone asked me once, you know, what, you know, I was giving a lecture on Cuban art. And said, Why, what is it that made uh, Cuba, you know, so different from, let's say, other Latin American cultures? And I, I kind of came up with a witty answer, which may not have really been what I wanted to say at that moment. I said, well... Cuba was a unique combination of African magic and power, Spanish grandeur, and American plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. Yeah, it is good. But what I, what I guess what I was aiming at is that the American component was part of our ethos because America brought this this forward-moving, future change is, you know, transformative. Uh, you, you realize yourself and your culture by coming up with new ways of doing this or that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't necessarily European. It was to a point, and, and certainly wasn't, you know, you don't see that in every culture. You see that in living, innovative cultures, where, and where you had that intersection of these traditions and this modern sense of inventiveness and fulfillment in coming up with a, yet another way of, you know, flipping this thing. That's a living culture. And that's a culture where culture itself, creativity, played a major role. Right. Cubans were in love with their own music. I've mm -hmm. traveled all over Latin America, and most Latin American uh, cultures look at their own music you know, with, with a certain sense of, oh, that's that stuff that, you know, the tourists consume or that we, we want to get away from that. We want to be international. Cubans had an international musical style that was Cuban. Yeah. And they turned it into a, a, an international style. The cha-cha, the mambo, the, the song. These things were heard and still are being heard all over the world. Benny More, man. Right. I just like, you know, that... that, that just Benny More as a whole. And, you know, we, we have it like uh, I must have like 40 Benny More songs, if there are 40 on our playlist at the restaurant. Just because when he sings that feeling, that whole thing, it makes me understand my culture better. And, and, and you know, like I, I say all the time, uh, it's interesting in my own head when I come up with new food and when we do uh, these tastings and things like that, I, I think to myself, is this something Benny would do? That's a good way of looking would he, Would he push this? Would he give a fuck about this? Would he like, uh, is this the, 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 like, is this what he wants people to remember? I think the same way because that's how I feel when I listen to his music. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about Cuba is that when Benny Moret was a star in Cuba in his time, and he wasn't the only one, yeah. there was all these other Celeste Mendoza and Olga Guillo and Celia Cruz and La Sonora and, and you know, Elena Burke and, you know, and Bola de Nieve, and we can go on and on and on. Cubans of that time went to see these people perform. They were intimately connected with that. And not only that, it's something very peculiar among Cubans. 
they quote lyrics of songs in the same way that other people might quote lines from philosophers or lines from Shakespeare or, you know, Cubans will suddenly like, to, oh, you know, miénteme más, right? And it, 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 there was an understanding that that popular music had a deep resonance within them as individuals and in their culture and that they could be immediately understood by another person they're talking to in that same culture. And it was the modern music that was being played in, in whatever cabaret in Havana that day. Right. So it was alive. It was transformative. They were taking all these things, changing them, altering them, propelling them into their own culture and from there beyond. And they were living it and they were experiencing, consuming it, to use your, your word, as part of their daily lives. And that was across all classes. Mm. whereas what I encountered in the rest of Latin America for instance it's it's not that way at all Latin Americans of a certain upper class they want to be associated with the cultural the popular culture or whatever of the United States of Europe but fill in the blank not their own right and if you ask them please take me to see you know some uh, you know local musical event oh that you want to go to that i mean they, they kind of recoil how could you want something so chuma and so vulgar <laughs> right but th in cuba that those distinctions w were totally non-existent and we picked that very cuban trait within us as children of exiles and we feel comfortable working with that tradition and making it alive because that was part of the Cuban mentality. Hmm. And and that's the way you make it connect. It isn't just simply the ingredients in a new way. It's also the fact that you feel perfectly comfortable with identifying with these elements that are part of everyday life. And I'm going to create something beautiful with this. That is what Benny More and all these other artists did. Amela Peláez, the painter, José Le Samalima, the poet, uh, you know, you name it, all these people. So this is what, it is a part of our Cuban culture to do that in mm -hmm. itself. I feel uh, I, I, when it comes to the conversation of always going back to that place of like Cuban American culture and uh I feel a sense of responsibility as being part of another generation to hold fast and to represent certain things because I feel like what what I want to represent and what the story I'd like to tell and the what I'd like for people to say when I'm older is that this person kept this story alive. I feel like a lot of times, as much as we live in Miami and we see the Cuban American culture every day being used, I, I feel like it's being, I feel like it's used and abused for people's uh, benefit of the dollar bill, right? All right. You know, when you see the, the dancers, and these are Cuban dancers, and the salsa and the thing, and that's what gets people in. I think it's a bunch of bullshit, you know? The culture means so much more. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are literally, and I, I feel like it's very real, we are trying to keep a tradition alive. Mm -hmm. Something that is every day being forgotten and dying, and it's something that, I know, like, I look at my grandparents. My grandparents are the real cooks in the family. I love my mother and my aunt and my sister and all of them, but they are not the real cooks in the family. My grandparents... Right, usually that's the case. Yeah, yeah my grandparents are the ones that, that um, you know, Ariet was a restaurant that they worked at in Cuba. Um, they taught me the importance of food through family. And I feel like it's it's a connection. It's more than just money. It's more than just uh, we need to use this as a crutch in order to get people in. And I think that 
like so many places, like uh, the ones that have the better names, like Ball and Chain and so on and so forth, people that use that to their advantage to say like, hey, we are Cuban, the tourists come look at us, whatever, and they're serving garbage product and garbage shit. It's all fucking smoke and mirrors, you know? It's all a bunch of bullshit in order to just for the for the American dollar. In reality, there's so many people that are trying to keep the tradition alive. And they're trying to uh, make sure that people remember there is a country 90 miles away that is suffering every day. And the uh, there's so many people here that are capitalizing on that. And instead of trying to talk about the story and trying to tell people who we are and what we do and that moment, that Benny More, that, that person, that thing that makes us so proud, uh, they're just making money off of it. Well, the tragedy is compounded by the fact that 60 years of communist totalitarianism has produced now a third generation of Cubans who actually hate their own culture, which is <laughs> unique yeah. in the history of Cuba. That's true. So that I encounter, having been encountering this for quite some time, Cubans who grew up in Cuba, they come here, and the last thing they want to hear about is anything Cuban. Right. And so you have this unique experience, because Cubans were the opposite of that. You know, they were very comfortable with, with, with the way their culture was evolving and progressing and changing, and now suddenly you find people who don't even know what that culture is and don't want to know because, oh, my God, I, I left that behind. I'm, they associate Cuba with terror and hunger and oppression. And now they just want to forget that episode and they want to move on quickly into something else and lose their identity in the process. So that's the, the, the worst part of the tragedy is that the good thing is we are the only Cuba that's left. We meaning in exile. Yeah. We meaning here who are still interested in shepherding the growth of that culture. We are what's left. What's over there are collaborators with the regime, even though some of them are artists and famous. <laughs> uh, you know, they're just, you know, paid clowns to to put on a propaganda show in some way shape or form very sophisticated one but nonetheless a propaganda show and then there's you know the the ones who are just pouring out the folklore in order to get the, the as you say people to come in and you know and have a cuban moment in their cliche vision of this right but the ones who are moving that culture forward are all in exile and they're the ones who the key is this, for, for the people who see themselves inside of a Cuban context, Cuba is dead. The ones who see Cuba as in them, and they are the context, Cuba is alive. Very alive. Very alive. And, and Cuba is alive in you, and it's alive in me, and, and, and it doesn't have to be more than, a, than X number of people who feel that way for it to be alive. And exile has taught us something. I call it more diaspora now because exile is the initial escape from the regime. And then afterward, you have to figure out how you continue with your identity, collective as well as individual, in a new context. That's what diaspora is. And for those people, um, the, the, the Cuba of the past has lessons, like the one I just, you know, we've been discussing that we were comfortable with modernizing and changing and evolving. And it also is a necessity because the past is important to everyone. Everybody needs the past. It's like a form of shelter. Mm. But if you, if you put that, that past in you and let it grow and evolve within you and your imagination and what you do, then you're keeping that, that, tradition alive automatically mm -hmm. if you just are throwing on the 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 attire and the and the cliche and that's it then cuba is dead it's a cemetery for you in which you are walking through for whatever reason for me cuba is a living thing within me i never went back to cuba to visit at all um because 
I, my sense is that going back to Cuba would be a form of collaboration or acceptance of that regime, and I, I, am, I refuse. So uh, Nick, Nick is yeah. uh, he's flagging me down because I know what he wants. I know what he wants. He what wants want? us to rein it in, and he wants. No, to that's talk. not at all what I want. Yeah, I'm going to let you decide when things get reined in. I was going to say I think this would be a good time. Like I would love to hear uh, each of you, uh, and I guess it got to because I don't I don't know how much of this I'd have heard from you or whether you have you know experience with some of this. But talking about people in exile moving the culture forward. I think Ricardo, you in particular, and, and maybe you, Mike, with like non-Cubans in, in food, that's an idea that um, is rejected or okay, like lechoga to people who are not familiar with that diasporic dynamic of Cuba. Or when you tell someone who, in quotes, you know, is a is a Cuba expert, right? Or or any of these academics who goes to Cuba often, or you know, chefs who go to Cuba all the time, and you tell them this oh, is where it's happening. Yeah. I'd love to, to I'd love to Cuba dig into that, dig into that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, let let uh, before I need to refill myself and freshen myself up. But before we talk about the chefs that visit Cuba, I'd like to pretext what the fuck that means because I I just talked about that. A couple of days ago, I remember when I was uh, a nobody, and now I'm still a nobody, but when I was a, a very nobody, and I worked for three other people, and um, Twitter ha is a hell of a universe, but I, I tweeted towards the world that the chefs that were visiting Cuba to experience the, few, the food that that Cuba had to offer, I felt like it was ridiculous. No, oh, it's an insult. It's an absolute fucking insult for anyone to tell me that you will experience the food of Cuba now. When a country has no food to experience, the culture has been stripped for 60 years, and it is not the culture and the country that my grandparents left because they were forced to leave to give me an opportunity to be here with you and these two people to talk about freely what I whatever the fuck I want to talk about. It is insulting. It is incredible that chefs would piggyback onto that and say, yeah, let's go and let's charge these Americans, a fuck ton of money to experience no food for a week. That is my experience with that like whole uh, let's connect people with the Cuban culture food now. And this well, was back in 2000 area. It's been open for five years. So that was seven years. So 2013. And I remember I was quoted in this article from a tweet and my boss at the time which i love dearly and he was on this podcast before michael schwartz pulled me into his office and said you know uh you said these things and i said yeah i said those things and he said you know i don't know and i was like i know you don't know but i know and he was like all right i'll take that and that's one of the reasons why i love michael schwartz so much because he didn't he didn't try to crush me at that time, and I was a nobody. I was just a sous chef at one of his restaurants, and uh, he could have made a bigger deal of it, and he didn't. And um, I still stand by those words, those sure. people, those chefs that went to Cuba to try to show, to experience food. Like, they don't know what the fuck they were talking about. That's not the... Well, I'll tell you what happens. This is a phenomenon which is even more depressing. Uh, I wanted to address something that you said about these people going to Cuba and all this. Oh, man. I love that whole... Let's address uh, all of that uh, because I fucking hated all of it uh, and it but, still upsets me to right well, now. Of and course it was seven it, years ago. I know. It's uh, it's still going on. Um, the, the most horrifying thing about it is that Cuba is simply an instrument of, on the one hand, of their self-promotion outside of Cuba. Mm -hmm. They go to Cuba to dress up as rebels. <laughs> to, Man, that makes me laugh. You know, it, it's sort of like, um, you know, you, 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 in, in Carnival, 
the the poor dress up as a fantasy you know the right. kings and you know and the ladies and this and that and yet they're just you know the poorest of the poor in many cases mm-hmm. cuba is a political carnival but it's a carnival that then later they can come back and i was in cuba and i you know i'm the rebel i broke the law i went there and i experienced this revolution and this thing and it's not a, they don't give a hoot about cuba or cubans or revolutions they true. are simply maquillando say they're adorning themselves for consumption here to advance their academic careers their artistic standing the the people on the left oh que lindo Twitter look at them it. this has nothing to do jay-z went to cuba too it's a form of yeah. it's a form of a political uh masquerade but it's not for their it's not like they went to cuba to find out what cuban cuisine is it's about them going to cuba credentialing themselves as rebels in some way shape or form and then using that in their careers here cuba is an instrument of their advancement here that's all that 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 that, that is about yeah, and then they wear the Che shirt, and they think that they're and, cool. And the, yes, the Santana, the whole bit. You know, they're all into this uh, branding of themselves as rebels because that's what sells in the culture mm-hmm. and and in the academic world. Mm-hmm. And that is it. It has not. They have no interest in in Cuba. Um, and then they they lecture people like me who know a great deal about Cuba because it's the place where I was born and I've taken a, a lifelong interest in, in really learning and understanding that culture, which is part, a great part of my legacy, of my tradition, of my heritage. And because they went to Cuba for four days <laughs> and they're lecturing me on how I should feel about Cuba. Why don't I go? Why do I support the embargo? Why do I have... A, it's hurting the Cuban people. Don't you care about the Cuban people? I actually had a conversation once with a dean in a university in, in, in a lunch in her house. Which university? For, in my honor. You want to say which university? And no. <laughs> and and she was... She wanted to like embarrass me or interrogate me in front of her minions. That's good. You know about about Cuba and the, oh she went to Cuba and it was marvelous and this and that and 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 where do you stand on the embargo because it was all about litmus testing you know where do you stand on this where do you stand on that you know what do you think about abortion what do you think about I don't know fill in the blank whatever the the topic was at that time and I was trying to just have lunch and get through this torture <laughs> God I love you man and and You're so at one point I just. You know, I said, okay, this woman needs a major correction. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're going to say that a lot now. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, I, I turned to her and I said, how long were you in Cuba? Oh, I was there for like four or five days. Oh. <sighs> and because what really hit me was that she was, when I said I support the embargo, because it's a way of, of, of you know, of, of, of punishing the regime and making it weaker. Fuck Yeah. Oh, but you you don't care about the Cuban people? And, and I go, look, I go, I'll tell you what. I'm going to ask you 10 questions that any Cuban kid in Miami, never mind in Cuba, could answer. And all I want you to do, since we're all teachers here, is I want you to pass the test. You're going to get seven of the 10 right. I'll tell you what, if you answer six of the 10... We can continue talking as equals on this subject. But if you fail the test, you're going to shut up. (laughs) And I am going to lecture you on Cuba because I know everything about Cuba and you know nothing. God, this is amazing. So, can we start the test? Everybody on the table was like... Oh, shit. This is the dean. We're all going to get fired. This is How was the food at the lunch? Oh, wait. I don't know. I threw it up later. Anyway, so... <laughs> Perfect. So I answer simple things like, name three cities other than Havana. 
Uh, name uh, a mountain range that's not the Sierra Maestra. Name three African gods that are venerated and worshipped in Cuba. Oof. Name that's the three one. saints that are that are equated to those to those three gods. Uh, you know, what does the year 1933 mean in Cuban history? The fall of Machado. What is the year, you know, just stuff like that. You know, what does the what does the 10th of October mean in Cuban history? You know, who was Cuba's first president? She couldn't get any of them. None of them. None of them. Yeah, Zero. no. No. And then at, at the last one was, who was Cuba's first president? I go, okay, would you take seriously a foreigner who has come to the United States for four days? And is, and is prepared to lecture you on your position on American policy on whatever, who doesn't know who George Washington is? Of course not. She started turning funny colors at that point. I'm sure. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's easy. And, and, and I told her, I will lecture you. I will charge you $500 an hour. You will pay me for three hours ahead of time. You will take notes. At the end of each lecture, you will have a 20-minute uh, respite to ask questions. You can be my student, but we cannot continue this conversation as equals because you know nothing on the subject, and I know everything. This is amazing. Obviously, the lunch ended quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have dessert. No. And but it, it's so easy. I am so, it's so up easy. With this leftist sanctimonious horseshit Ooh. that Ooh. they they can. I, it wouldn't occur to me, for instance. I've been to Venezuela a billion times. I was married to a Venezuelan. Bless you. I. I know Venezuela backwards and forwards. I've traveled the entire country. I was a, I, I lectured there. I organized exhibitions. I was interviewed in every major news organization of Venezuela. When, when, when the whole Chavez thing began, people started asking me here, what do you think about Venezuela? And I go, well, I'm an anti-communist, but if you really want to know about Venezuela and Chavez, you should ask a Venezuelan. Because I'm not going to presume to, to tell you what Venezuelans think, although, and why? Because a lot of American liberals and leftists constantly are telling me what I should think as a Cuban. Yeah. Every chance I get, I drill that point home, and then that shuts off all the lights. <laughs> it shuts off all the lights, because what are they going to tell me? You know, what are they going to say? So this poor woman, I, you know, uh, later she apologized. I'm sure she did. I, I love, I loved, I had a conversation with a very dear friend of mine and a former PCP uh, guest about communism and socialism. And their thing was like, well, Cuba is a bad example. <laughs> I said, well, explain that to me a little bit more. How is a how is Cuba a bad example? Yeah, Cuba is a bad example, but that is what communism and socialism is. In essence, um, I mean, there's a lot of people that hang their hat on saying this is the way it's supposed to be. And yeah, but they go further. They use an imaginary ideal communism. And they compare and contrast that with a real capitalism. Ideal. So it's like it's an absurdity. Ideal communism doesn't exist. Of course not. No, the real communism is the one that has always existed. It's a totalitarian state. It thrives on poverty. It impoverishes rich nations. It needs poverty to control its people. It needs terror. It is all built on lies. Fear. And, and fear and terror, fear. of course. Yeah. And, you know, somebody asked me, oh, but, you know, Fidel Castro is very, like, he's unpredictable. Well, he's not unpredictable at all. He's predictable. All you have to do is remember that whatever he says, you flip it, and that's the truth. So he will tell you the truth in reverse. I have no power in Cuba. Means I have all the power in Cuba. Uh, you know. People decide their fates. Nobody can decide their fate. <clears throat> and so and so forth and so on. <clears throat> so 
Oh, but you're, you're talking about a madman. I go, yes. You know, in other words, what you're describing is a madman. I go, exactly. What you think you're describing is a, a leader. And El I'm comandante. describing a lunatic. Yeah. An insane, psychopathic nutcase who has destroyed a country and, and, and wants credit for creating a, or lifting a country. I mean, it's, it's that level of delusion. He, so that's he, what these people want. They don't. They know this. Yeah. You know how you. You know how you know that they know this. Nobody stays. None of these travelers decide. Oh, I'm in paradise. I want to live here because if I thought I went to a country and I thought it was paradisical, I would want to live there. Let me buy a timeshare. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Bu- let me stay here. No one's buying timeshares in Havana. No. No. They're they not. They they're don't. buying timeshares in like Sicily. So this is what how you can tell that these people are 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 simply using Cuba as a virtue signaling phenomenon that has marketable value here. Mm. So when they asked me about the embargo, I I immediately says, "And did you support the embargo against South Africa during apartheid?" Well, yes. Well, then why is it different in Cuba? Oh, Cuba's always different. Well, no, it's not always different. It's a tyrannical state. But it's got the most beautiful beaches. <laughs> I mean, that's really, that's the shit that people say, right? It's like, that's why Jay-Z went to fucking Cuba. Like, because it's got the most beautiful beach. I, I, I was once talking to this uh, major artist in South America who was um, another one of these, lived in a, in a palatial estate, had all the money and the fame. It was revered in his nation. And he had gone to Cuba and of course, and then he was telling me about, you know, but in Miami, all you have are these, you know, these oligarchs that got thrown out of Cuba. I go, Miami has about a million and a half Cubans yeah. and Cuba in 1960 had a population of six million. You're telling me that in a country with six million people, a million and a half of them are oligarchs. That's one hell of a country. I'll tell you my, <laughs> my, my, I mean. My grandfather, my, my grandfather that I, I love dearly, like the salt of the earth, not an oligarch. Of course not. I mean, that guy, you know, there's a, a photo of him in the restaurant, not where you guys were sitting today, but making uh, coconut pastries in a bakery that he made. He made an oven out of uh, basically using the pieces of a tree to uh, make the the wood to warm this oven the furthest thing from an oligarch you can find forward you know and that that man f- fled from the country that he loves he loved and he still loves now at 93 years old just to give us an opportunity so i could sit here with you and have this conversation oh, no. and that's why like i i take so per- i was born hylia like I'm, I'm, I'm American, but the deep rooted pain is so prevalent, you know, and that's why, you know, I, I feel like at the end of the day, that's really the purpose I have. I have the, I, I want to, that, that conversation you had with the dean of a school is a conversation I have with people all the time. Put them to that test. They will shit in their pants. Yeah. It, it could even you see the smugness that, oh, I know, I have this vision and I want you to admire me for it. You go, okay, you know all about this. Just basic questions. And they start getting very, very strange because you're basically <laughs> ripping their clothes off and throwing them naked in front of the world. And they don't like that. So all you got to do is just ask them these basic questions. And if they can't answer them, then they then they have to acknowledge that you're the one who has to lecture them if they want to listen to you. And that changes, that, that, that destroys the smugness instantaneously. It's fun. But it- there's something else I wanted to add before you forget. You mentioned the pain. We live in a society that has lost its epic sense of life. America, after the Second World War, wanted to just hunker down, have fun, enjoy yourself, fulfill yourself, make lots of money, 
get crazy, do whatever that is that make that turns you on so that you can enjoy yourself. That's the whole point of American life at the moment. America had a, an epic sense of life. It was the epic of the immigrant and the exile, the person who, who, who fled persecution, who fled wars, who built their own, their family and their own identity up, who succeeded, who became, whose children went to college, uh, and so forth and so on. That epic sense of life has long since passed. Mm -hmm. What distinguishes you and me and other Cuban Americans who feel this pain in this history poignantly is that we have an epic sense of life that Cuba and its misery has given us. Mm -hmm. For me, life is a struggle for the truth. And whether it's just the truth about Cuba or the truth of my art or the, or the, all these other truths that are constantly being trampled, that's my epic, the center of my epic sense of life. That's when somebody asks me, but you know, you lived here all your life, you're an American. I go, mm, no, yes and no, yes. Obviously, I speak English, I write in English. I can also write in Spanish. I'm perfectly fluent in Spanish, totally. Um, but this epic sense of life is gone in the United States. They don't even know what it is. And it's too bad because they don't know what they're missing. Because without that, a nation does not have a future. Right. You can't have a future just thinking about how much fun you're having. Yeah. No. That's not what a future is built on. And that's the first thing that America lost, and that's when it started, when its troubles really began. Mm. Go ahead. I don't even remember what the fuck I was about to say, because that, that was, I mean, like, I, I, um, being someone that was born here, and, um, the only sense of pain I feel is through the voice of my grandparents. Because even my, my parents, they, they came at such a young age, I don't think that they totally understood the, the sense of the pain, right? <clears throat> I feel like it resonates more with me because we are trying to latch on to something. We're trying to understand who we are. And that's why I always say we are the children of the lost. You know, like there's... There's a facet of people saying that Cuba's fine. Everything's fine. The embargo's been lifted. You know, people can visit. It's all good. There's tourism. Castro's dead. Things have happened. Things are different. And in reality, nothing is different. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. People struggle. That's why people turn cars into boats and they try to get here. That's why people are still coming here every single fucking day. That's why the America that people shit on every day is the America that people are fleeing to. And I know that me, I, like I am a liberal, right? I am that person. I still understand what that means. What that means to my family, what that means to me as a person. So many things. That's why I am the controversial liberal. That's why I am the person that people always want to fight against. Well, what, why don't you want to stand with us? Because I don't, I, first of all, I don't stand with a facet that I don't know what the fuck that means. Because that's what caused the whole problem to begin with. Mm. In my country, years before I was born, that's what caused the problem. We want to stand with someone that we don't really know what the fuck that means. I want to know what the fuck this all means. I want to know every little nook and cranny about what the fuck, you know, you want me to join a group? First of all, I don't want to join your group. No, of course not. I want, I want to be my own group. And I feel like we are our own group of people. And I think that's what makes Miami so special. I think we're such a melting pot of controversy. Like, we just, like, no one agrees. The three people that, because uh, we just met, but the three people on this side of the table, we don't agree on shit. But I still love these guys. You know what I'm saying? But that's part of who we are. And that's part of freedom. Huh? That's part of that, 
that essence of being free that I can disagree with Nick and I can disagree with Carlos and we could still be friends. They don't want to persecute. Well, that's changing rapidly in the in the general American culture. But I, I, now I, we're factional. I also believe. I also believe that the grandeur of media is why it seems like it's so factioned, because there there are I feel like more people like Nick and I. And you and, and uh, just because we're we are recording a podcast, um, the. The last podcast that we did have, Nick and I disagreed for two and a half hours, actually, give or take. But we agreed, in essence, in the fact that we can still have a common ground. And I think that's the essence of freedom. I think that is the essence of what makes us very distinct, is that I could disagree with him, and I could disagree with you, and I could disagree with Carlos, but it doesn't mean that uh, you know, anyone's going to persecute me. Right. And I, I think that for now, for now, I hope that it stays that way. But I mean, like, well, it depends what profession you're in, because I, I spent 40 years of my life in the academic world. And increasingly, if you didn't have, you know, the right political, the correct political positions, you know, you are shut out, you are persecuted maybe not to the point of being arrested and thrown into a concentration camp, but your career suffers, your connection with your colleagues I suffers. Mean, is I feel that. I feel that because I am, I am increasingly outspoken about how I disagree with our officials, right? And I disagree with our officials because we are the ones that put them in power. And I feel like um, we can come to a common ground, but at the end of the day, part of my freedom is to disagree with you. And if you don't like it, I honestly don't give a fuck. I don't care. Right. And you know what I've been told several times because, you know, uh, it goes back to the fact that I own a business and I am responsible for several people and I'm responsible for livelihoods of several people. You should watch what you say. That's what I've been told. You should watch what you say. And I've been told and I have said in response, fuck you. I will never watch what I say because... Part of my freedom and the and the reason why my grandfather and my grandmother struggle to this day to be in a house in Little Havana instead of their house in Pinar del Rio where they should be is because they wanted me to have a right to say whatever the fuck I wanted. And I will say whatever the fuck I want because I see them saying like, do and be who you are but when they threaten you with those with that watch what you say keep in mind this that one of my favorite uh modern philosophers said his name was nicholas berjaev he was a russian who lived through the stalinist period finally managed to escape russia eventually he would die like in 1936 i believe in in paris he wrote some fabulous books my favorite one is Slavery and Freedom. You should pick, get that book and read it. It's amazing. And in Slavery and Freedom, he says something which you should remember next time they tell you that. They said, the truth, he said, the truth is always dangerous. Oh, yeah. So when they're warning you, you, th you say, thank you. You are confirming that I am speaking the truth. Why? Yeah. Because the truth is always dangerous. If I weren't talking the truth, you wouldn't be trying to shut me up. It's that simple. Well, in modern days, what it would say is if you didn't have any haters, that means you're not doing it right. That's what the modern day person would say. That's in 2020. Yeah, but, but, but haters are simply an emotional reaction to what you are saying. No, but it's simplifying an intellectual right. thought. That's all it is. But the danger here comes from established power. Yeah. entrenched power if you're speaking something that is going to get you into trouble it's because it's the truth they don't they don't arrest you in cuba for speaking a lie you get arrested for speaking a truth it's that simple and so that's something that these people are preparing us for here the leftists and all their their lunatic assumptions about what is right and what is wrong and that is the gist of where they're coming from. Mm. It's about power. It's not about disagreement. 
It's about power that requires everybody to either be silent or to be vocal in their agreement of what power says. Silence means you're afraid and you will go along. Preferably, they want you to sign on. And at some, and at some point, they will make you sign on. That's when people get on boats and leave. Yeah. I'm not leaving. I don't know about anyone else here, but I'm not leaving. Oh, I'm not leaving either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but the but the point is that the societies when they lose their way have, are at a greater risk of becoming totalitarian than societies who know what you just said, the, the tradition of freedom. We can disagree, we can agree to disagree. I'm not your enemy because I have a different position. Right. If you don't want to listen to my position, then don't ask for it. Yeah. Simple as that. But then they ask you, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And when you say it, oh, my God, be careful. You're an asshole. Be careful what you say. Watch your words. Yeah, no. I mean, (laughs) I think that this year has uh, put me in a position more so in the past than in the past. Uh, Like... Uh, I'm okay with disagreeing with political figures because their politics is getting in the way of my livelihood. And I feel like that that is, in essence, kind of like what uh, the destruction of Cuba, the beginning of it, was. Was their politics was in the, in the way of people's business. And... People can disagree with me until they're blue in the face, and it's fine. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with my stance being mine. Um, but you can't impose your will on me. No, and you can't ask me to take a, a series of propaganda, nonsense, and lies as as equal to my knowledge of facts. Right. That that I don't accept. Oh, you have a different opinion. No, no, you don't have any information. And therefore, what your, your opinion is based on nothing. So that is also an important distinction. It's not just simply, oh, I think X and you think Y. Well, but if Y is completely off in terms of the facts on which it is based, that has to be challenged. For sure. It isn't just simply you like chocolate and I like vanilla. No, no, no. Moment <laughs> equal. Moment <laughs> equal. It's more, it's more complicated than that. I'm going to I'm going to take a break and I think that when we come back maybe we'll actually talk about your past. So people actually know. <laughs> well, who's past? Yours. I Mine. Mean, I, yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> okay. I, th- I think that's important. I feel like Nick is probably itching at the fact that he was like, "Wait, we should talk about wh- why and who this I'm person like is." I'm like a year past the point where it bothers me, but yeah, that is what I <laughs> Welcome to the next episode of Pancom Podcast. Okay, so where are we going now? No, let's talk about, no, you know, already part four. we've already, I think, I don't know how long we've been recording, probably a while, but um, well, an hour and a half. That's fine. Yeah. You, sir, are uh, one of the more accomplished people that we've ever had on the show. Thank you for being on the show. Oh. You're this welcome. Is a, but it's an it's an honor we and need a to pleasure. Get more, we need to get more people than there. <laughs> <laughs> I think between you and my mentor, uh, Norman Van Aken, this, oh, the prop, Norman. Uh, Norman is like my godfather. He is the man, and uh, there's not enough good words to speak about Chef Norman Van Aken. Yeah. Um, but. I know we've been talking for a long time, but let's tell people you were born in Havana. Yes. And you came here when you were how old? I was six. Six. Yes. Okay. 1960. 1960. And what, like, what propelled you to here? And I say here because no one can see. My arms are all over the place. This room and this house full of beautiful artwork and what propelled you to be an art critic, poet, person of the people? Wow. Well, I can tell you how, I guess, 
you, you discover that you're an artist at some point in your life. In my case, it was I was quite young. I mean, I'd always been interested in drawing and uh, read a lot as a kid. I was, I guess, the typical geeky, nerdy, you know, kid. Yeah, you don't and, you don't strike me as any of those things. Well, but um, then you went to I'm, Berlin. I'm wearing a, a disguise uh, for this podcast. <laughs> and, that that makes me more worldly and <laughs> and acceptable to my adoring fans. But <laughs> when everyone's gone, I slip into my nerd, <laughs> <laughs> and you know my nerd routine, and that's the real me. Um, you discover you're an artist. It's something that you know you are. That's all there is to it. And uh, I write. I, I, I've been writing poetry all my life. It's the center of my life. Everything else, the art criticism and, and the collecting and everything is really centered on, on my poetry, on my life as, as, a, as a creative individual. And um, I don't know, you just find yourself in the middle of your life. And uh, if you've lived it authentically, if you've lived it because you discover within yourself what you are, are destined to be and dedicate your life to and you do it uh everything else unfolds and surprises you along with uh, others but if you don't live authentically and uh you, you just simply you know do what others expect of you and that's what you become then the only thing that that awaits you is boredom and regret meter made or anything else. There's people who can, who seem to be very accomplished, but they. I've had many friends. I encounter many people in the in, in the arts who have a lot of money and who have this and that, and and then they tell you, you know, I really wanted to be whatever, and you're astonished at mm -hmm. at that because, well, my goodness, um, I, I've I've always done this, and this is who I am. Uh, I, I I am what I do, and I do what I am. Amen to that. That's it. 100%. So I don't, whatever else comes as a result of it, well, fine. As as for the art, I early on embarked on, a, on, a, on, on an interest in Latin American art mm -hmm. uh, because as part of that pain you were talking about, the loss of Cuba and my right to live in the country of my birth in freedom and dignity, um, having lost that, I I looked for Cuba in other Latin American societies, mm -hmm. and and it was very helpful in that way because it helped me understand the uniqueness of Cuba, but also the reverberations and echoes of certain aspects of Cuban culture, which I found in other countries in Latin America, but. What fascinated me was the that Latin American art, in particular the visual arts, were totally ignored in this country and still are largely. And it has to do with the fact that I think Latin America came up with something very brilliant, which is they took modernism from Europe and they... But they had something that the Europeans... Did, did not have. The modernist ex experiment or adventure in European art was shrouded or triggered in large part by the, the disaster of World War I. Mm. That shattered the Europeans' sense of their, of their own identity and their history dramatically to the point that the modernists wanted to, like, you know, just get rid of history and come up with something completely new and different because the, the civilization of their traditions brought them to the trenches of World War I. Latin America did not have that trauma. So when they imported the, the stylistic innovations of the modernists of Europe, they wanted to connect that with their legacy. They, in other words, they wanted the past to be part of their aesthetic present which was shocking from a European standpoint. The whole point of modern art is to get away from, from, from that horrible past that destroyed us. 
in Latin America, these this language that they were importing was a way of actualizing and helping them understand their indigenous roots, their African roots, their their European roots. So you see people like Rufino Tamayo, Wilfredo Lam, you know, Roberto Mata, uh, Tamayo was Mexican, Lam Cuban, uh, Torres Garcia of Uruguay, um, Mata of Chile. And, you know, the names, you know, I could just rattle off another hundred names of individuals who, who, who use history in the way that we talked about before as, as, a, as an element that now gets to be reshaped in a new way, and that helps us move forward. This was un, unbelievable to the modernists of Europe and also of the United States because the Americans, for all their vaunted, oh, we're Americans, we're not Europeans, we do our own thing, baloney, they picked up that same anti-past attitude of the Europeans. So when they encounter the Tamayos and the Torres Garcias and the Matas and the Lams and the Frida Kahlos and the Olga de Marals and the, you know, the rest of them, they don't know what the hell to make of this because they're not playing by the same rules. You're supposed to come up with something completely different and new and forget your past. Mm. And the Latin Americans had that sense that the past and the present are constantly interacting and in fact the present is made up of a forum of pasts that then reconfigure and move forward Amen to that. and that's a very latin american sensibility which fascinated me it was part of the cuban imagination and it's part of the entire continent's imagination so at the age of 20 i took off from mexico to interview mexican artists and writers and it was there that i met rufino tamayo uh one of the great artists of the 20th century and spent several days talking with him and interviewing him and you know getting to know him and his his environment and i turned 21 in mexico happy uh, birthday and i and i invited rufino tamayo and his wife olga to have dinner with me to celebrate my 21st birthday. That, that isn't nerdy and geeky. I don't know what is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was my birthday celebration. I just turned 21. I'm inviting the greatest living artist in the world and his wife to come and have dinner with me. And and on from there, I, you know, I traveled throughout the continent uh, and and wrote about their, the art that I encountered and bought a lot of that art and brought it here and helped launch the international careers of several artists. And, and that was my passion because n not only was it my, my legacy, nobody was looking at it the right way. To this day, Latin American art was always thought of in terms of content. It was Latin American if it had a reference Ugh. to something Latino. Uh, you know, uh, the palm tree or the, or the Aztec pyramid or the whatever, fill in the blank, you know, all the cliches. And that was not what interested me. I wanted the, the dynamics of that imagination to be understood in a different way. And so I wrote about that at length, books and essays and, and, and so forth. And so... That's what got me here, my, my love of the Latin American mind and my yearning to piece together from what I experienced in Latin America, what Cuba, the Cuba that I was not allowed to experience might have been like mm -hmm. in, 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 in high culture. As well as in popular culture, I mean, when I went to to all these places in Latin America, I would lose myself in those cities. I would I would seek out the music and the popular art. A lot of the stuff that I, I collect, for instance, was has been uh, self taught artists, naive artists that you know never went to school. Many of them don't even know how to read or write, and yet they create paintings and and carvings. And, and I, I'm in love with that because. That is also something that we have, by and large, lost in our culture. Uh, yes, we have some naives, but usually they're, they're seen as something separate. In Latin America as well, I think of them as, I mean, I, I exhibit them along with all my other fine art or whatever you want to call it. 
Um, so that was what propelled me in, in, my, in my search. And my poetry was very influenced by, by various philosophers, something, again, not very common because most poets in the United States, they go to you know, MFA programs and so forth, they, they just steer them away from the world of ideas. They, you know, they get them into contemporary issues. And, Too structured. You know, and, they, no, and they go, they're almost like writing you know, journalism that looks like a poem. Well, because journalism is dead. Yeah, well, but you know what I mean. Just very, very focused on issues and, and challenges and social issues and political stuff. And, you know, I do talk about, you know, the, the great themes of politics and society, some of which you touched on, freedom and other things like that, that are important, obviously, to, to the Western tradition. But my focus is on, on creating a fine art myself as a poet and uh and that's what my life has been all about my poems have have also become very very much influenced by the art mm. because the artists the painters taught me how to see the world in a different way the details the colors the forms the the shapes the subtleties the internal rhymes of forms the the that the, and the fact that when you look at a painting when you read a poem, it's word word by word, and then you put it all together in your mind. When you're looking at a painting, it's it's all there. Then you can navigate it. So I learned how to to take in the world of an image in my mind, so that when I write, I am very deeply influenced by the vividness that art taught me, and by that that unitary impact of an image, which I also learned from not just from the artist, but from living surrounded by art and um it's very difficult for me to imagine my life without this stuff i mean i mean this is a whole different type of life yeah this is uh the one thing i didn't hear you say is the looking at something and it provoking a thought which for me it when i when i look at food or art and i don't know if we actually recorded the fact that i just bought my first piece of art a year ago uh by a guy named matt hergett which was a, a friend of mine that came up in the food and beverage industry just like me and that i find extremely talented and uh, a great soul in essence when I look at his art, it evokes emotion. And for me, I look at all these things like, you know, I don't know. I don't know who did that. That The large one there, the, the cabra. It's, a, it's a, a goat skull. Right. A drawing of a goat skull. And it's by a Cuban painter. That's a Cuban painter. Yes. His name is Alexander Morales. He lives here in Miami. Does he? That right that, there is incredible he lived at the time he painted that in 2000 he was in cuba and he was in the army in the obligatory you know the servicio militar and it was also the height of that special period uh which was cuba's always had a special period there's always been poverty and, and it was just more acute during that period perhaps and he stole a military tent is that what that is? Yes. Because I was wondering why it had divots in the middle. It's, it's a tent. It's a military tent that he stole because he had no canvas. So he stole it. Right. <laughs> and then he, the paint, God knows what it is. And, um, and so there's this wonderful goat skull, which, of course, just brings in not just the theme of death, but also of, uh, you know, of, of, of rituals and magic and whatnot. What I love about that piece is that it unites drawing, painting, and architecture. If you look at the tent in that way, a shelter. And all those things come together in that one image. It's, it's a very powerful painting. I loved it. When I saw it. I this, just had uh, to have it. Uh, obviously, the, this house that you have, this home, is very thought-provoking in several ways. Like when... Uh, you asked me several times, if you have a question, just ask it. 
I consume information and it takes me time to uh, manipulate that into a question. And there's so much information to take in here. I know. There's so uh, the only thing that really struck me, so many things did, but that would equate a thought or a question was the crow, the door. Because to me, that means so many things ap apart from the fact that someone did it. And this piece, because I felt like there was more behind it than just the fact that someone did a goat's head. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw the divots and I saw the things. and I, it, So it's, a, it's just the very surface is something that, it, that is telling you there's... You can hide in this. You can you can seek shelter in this. Right. It, it, yeah. But that that is, in essence, what art means, right? Like thoughtful art and right. thoughtful things, whether it be within food or within a canvas or within what that door is. Let's look at this painting, for instance. This is another interesting painting. Um, it's a female nude, obviously, in a room. Uh, and it's... It's called bromeliad uh -huh. because of the, the image of the bromeliad in the back. You notice there's a lot of distortion in the in the in the figures and mm -hmm. the figure itself and in the room. It's by a Chilean artist. It was a dear friend. It was also died many years ago. His name was Enrique Castro Cid, one of the most brilliant, if not the most brilliant, person I've ever met. Enrique was not just a, a, a great visual thinker. He was also a mathematician. He was extremely knowledgeable in physics and mathematics. He was one of the pioneers of uh, in computer programming and digitizing, for instance, electromagnetic currents uh, to, to, to be able to study them as equations and so forth and so on. So what you see here is a painting that is Enrique's response very latin american response by the way to uh the randomness we associate with modern art see we we think of art as in modern art oh, the painter wants to you know splat paint and do this and that it's all about freedom and abstraction and creating forms out of that emotional or intellectual moment but enrique wanted to get away from the randomness that was associated with modernism so he did it through mathematics. Now, what you see is a painting on canvas, acrylic on canvas. But to get to that image, he would use many different equations that integrated up to 16 different dimensions of space into that image. And that could only be done with a computer. So, and he would pick the, the, the image that was most appealing. In other words, he asked himself a simple question. What would that woman look like if she were in a subatomic world? If she were standing in a room that was affected by the different warps and shapes of space in, at the edge of a black hole or inside of, you know, in the world of quarks and so forth. And... He used these different equations to integrate on a two-dimensional canvas, basically the infinite. It's the entire universe and its laws are in that painting. The loops, for instance, are points of singularity or black holes. And that black hole in turn shapes and distorts everything. Let me put it this other way. We live in a Euclidean world that is you walk across this room and every tile is the shape is the size of every other tile it's like you're walking across a ruler right nothing happens to you your shape and your form is is intact right but if you lived in a world of 16 different dimensions that would be a very different walk it would be a, a much more thoughtful walk well, it would be a very distortioned and, and weird and you know crazy walk so, and I think I would describe it as in, 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 in painting, the infinite starts at the, at the edge of the canvas and moves out in all directions. Mm -hmm. 
In my paintings, the infinite starts at the edge of the canvas and moves in. Mm. So here we have a painting who's from the early 80s, whose scientific acumen, whose mathematical brilliance, and whose aesthetic statement is vibrant, is ahead of its day today. What, what some artists who use computers do, fractals and, you know, all that funny stuff, that's all decorative. This is an artist who used a computer as an intellectual device to explore the infinite in a painting. Now, where does Latin America come in? Because Latin American art was not at war with reference, right? Modernism tended to distort the, the, and, and move toward abstraction because it wanted to get away from reference, that something that looks like something in a painting. Right. That points to something in the real world in a painting. That was considered cliche. That was considered the old stuff. What Enrique does is that he, he understood that in Latin American art, concepts were part of that art. Philosophical ideas were referenced. In Jesus Soto, the one there on top of the, of the bed, for instance, the kinetic artist from Venezuela, motion and and optical effects and which the one infinite. there's three the, pieces the one there. the black and white box in the middle yes yeah i've been looking at that a lot so someone like soto was a thinker also in terms of mathematics and the infinite because latin americans were not afraid of exploring ideas in their paintings Unlike the Americans, for instance, who are like, oh, no, art is just about blobs of paint on, you know. But I think it shows a lot about Latin American culture. Yes. In other words, art was a branch of philosophy. In the United States, art was not a branch of philosophy. It's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. And here you have an artist who's presenting you with very complex mathematical and philosophical ideas in a painting. That's not typical of North American art at all. For me, that's the real Latin America, right? Not mangoes and and uh, <laughs> and you know whatever Espero. you know and yeah. Well, yeah, no. <laughs> so that is an important distinction, right? Um, so that's what we have in this marvelous painting. It, so is this? I'm answering a question that you've already answered, but. All the reasons that you've mentioned, like this piece right here, means much more theoretically than what I thought when yes. I first saw it. Right. But that's because I'm not an art person. No, but many art people don't see it either because they'd have to know the history of Enrique Castro Sid's art and how it got here. Right. You know, so they could just look at, oh, yeah, it's, you know, a nude and she's got weird arms and, you know, and her hair is kind of uh, out of control. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I look at all of this and then when you talk to me about the intricacies of what this really means, it's so deep. Is that the difference between why you took on Latin American yes. arts? The depth the to the thinking North American answer. art. Yeah, I didn't. Very few Amer North American artists gave me that that kind of. Comp I mean, I, it just oh okay, they're just trying to do something new and different that no one's ever done before. You know, whatever. Paint so, with. Uh, so has Latin whatever, American art gotten gotten the uh, credit that it should no. compared to North American? No. no Why? Because, because the art world is run by money, and the money. But it is ran by, and you know, I know shit about art. I, the, I would never claim to know shit about what it is that you do. But uh, in the younger world of people that have money that I once ran in that threw pig parts Ooh. at my door, um, <laughs> they it's all about how much money they can make on a piece of art after the fact. I, I never equate art to money. Of course not. Right. Right. But it, in essence, and we'll go back to what we talked about, I don't know, how, however long we've been talking, but um, food doesn't equate money to me. 
food equates expression, thought, uh, story, conversation, so many other things. Oh. And in essence, I do run a business and I have to equate it to money, but that's so far after the fact oh, for me. Right. And paintings also have to be sold and that also involves and money. That, right? And that involves money. And I, I remember there was a time in my life that I ran with people that uh, would say, you know, we buy a piece of art because it has liquidity. Right. Because it would make money after the fact. As I sit here with you, which I fear I feel like very outmatched <laughs> when we talk about art, we're talking about art in a different stratosphere. Right. We're talking about art meaning so many different things. This piece that to me means, like you said, uh, a nude with a woman with weird hair and there's weird lines and so on and so forth, but it means so much more. It means... And I'm sure there's money attached to this, for sure. Well, not as much as you would think. He he was um, he's he's a much undervalued genius. He himself. But how many times have you said that an undervalued genius? Yeah, a lot. But a lot. A lot. But in his case, it was particularly tragic. He was for many years, for about ten years, he was married to a member of. Perhaps the richest family on the planet. Ooh, on the planet. Yes. And and certainly the richest family involved in the arts. Wow. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. <laughs> Can we get a last name? Sure. He was married to Christophe de Menil. The de Menils have a, don't have a high profile because they, they don't want to have a high profile. Good for them. But they they have um, vast fortunes. They were originally French uh, Protestants whose, uh, whose grandfather, great-grandfather, was one of the, uh, the, the persons who really invented the modern petroleum industry. Jeez. That sounds financially stable. Yes. <laughs> And to this day, they, you know, their empire is like way beyond petroleum. It's like, you name it. Um, they, they since moved from France to New York and from New York to Texas and everywhere That's where else. that big money is over there in Texas. And they, they are, every member of the family collects art, different kinds of art, you know, uh, but they're just limitless funds. And and he was married to to one of the the granddaughters of this individual, and so he was connected to everybody that you could possibly imagine in the art world. Anybody that you could possibly imagine. The art world. I find I find the art art world so interesting. <laughs> it's bizarre to say the least. It, it's like it's. Um, uh, and again, I, I go back to that time that when I when I ran with people that had enough money to buy these things. But it, it's like uh, it's the funds seem so limitless at times when they use to buy or to purchase and to sell the artwork that. I don't know, and that's why I'm looking around this room, and I, I go back to a time like three years ago when I uh, catered a, our Basel event. And that's an interesting topic to talk about with someone that actually cares about art. Art Basel, right? right? That whole, uh, what I feel like, and I, I don't know, and you would correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like Art Basel is the equivalent of the South Beach Food and Wine Festival for food. Mm. What Art Basel is for art is what South Beach Food and Wine Festival is for food. And it's this dumbed down, ridiculous notion that within a week you will understand or you will be able to consume the art of several countries and people and thoughts. No, I think what our Basel, it's just simply a, a, a meeting of, of people who have a, a 
people who fly into Basel for Basel are already collectors. They're very wealthy, and they, they collect art that other wealthy friends also collect. So when, when you went, and I visited many of these collections over the years, and what, what strikes me as really amazing is how similar they are. You know, you walk in the one one vast collection, and they all have the same artists, the same, you know. Right. And it's the artists that are, you know, on the hit parade that are now fashionable, that have been moved up because they're having a show in this museum or that and whatever. The banana. Right, right. And so they're, or the, or the banana just for shock value. That was just a news piece, and obviously it was successful. It worked, it, it worked. worked. It so worked. what you have is, uh, you know, I call them the safari collectors. These are these are hunting trophies. You know, oh look, I you know, I did this. I hunted on this, this year. One. Yeah, this oh, is the this is what this I is did. The, the head of this animal, and I have them all you know in trophy cases. And, um, <laughs> that's such a good, that's such a good like uh, connection. And, and, and but but you ask these people, why do you, what do you get out of living from with that painting or that sculpture? They can't tell you. They go like because uh, the, the prize piece. They, they, don't, they don't know what the hell to tell you because right. they don't live with it. They live they at it. it. Yeah, they have it. They, have they, it. they, they, they live in its proximity, but it, they, it might as well be, you know, a moon rock. I mean, <laughs> that, <laughs> there, there's no, that, just because you own a moon rock doesn't turn you into a geologist. Right. So it's just this rock. Oh, it's for the moon. Look how cool. I got, you know, they, you know, a moon rock. Okay. Uh, what do you know about it? Uh, <laughs> nothing right so it's just a moon rock it's a trophy look how important i am i have a moon rock so it's a bunch of moon rocks for these people so i i don't take it, any it, of them I, I feel like it shows uh financial fortune like this is who i am i paid yeah, this much for this snob thing. stuff yeah, oh i yeah I, i've seen people in art basel galleries uh, there was this one couple once and i overheard them talk and the husband liked this piece, whatever it was. I don't even know what it, who it was. And and the wife said, "Oh, but it's it's only uh, like one point three million, and, <laughs> and uh, it's like we've got to buy something better than this. You know, we got to be bigger, bigger, more money. Bigger we, is we, better. We need to spend at least four or five it's million. A very or American and, ideal. And I'm going like, whoa, am I in the wrong place? Um, but that doesn't mean that there are not beautiful and interesting works in there, but not everything is of the same um, authenticity. And so if you're looking for authenticity, then that's a whole different thing. I feel like maybe, and I, I don't know, uh, in the process of the artist, in that art basil culture, maybe they lose... A segment of who they are for to make that 1.3 million on an art piece, which because they can only get it at our Basel, or or they could get it somewhere else. But but they're 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 just in it for you know the snob appeal of having this very valuable thing that's a hot item, and and it will also go up because if it's worth 1.3 million, it's not going to go down. Believe me, uh, you know, no. so it's going to keep going up and up and up. After, after art hits a certain price, then the work of that artist is pretty much guaranteed to keep escalating. Going up. They're yeah, blue chips. Up. Yeah. So if you have the blue chip, then, you know, you go to that and you, and you buy it because it will go up. And at some point you will auction it or sell it for 10 times what you paid. And that will then turn be 10 times what that person paid when he or she sells it. So, um. I, 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 for me, that's also so boring. It's sort of like uh, deciding who you're gonna fall, you know, you fall in love with or make, you know, marry be on 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 the basis of I don't know whether she has good teeth, <laughs> or, or you know, I don't know how big her tits are. Yeah, for instance. But even, <laughs> but even that could play a role in attraction. Obviously, you know, just something trivial. You know right. that that and and and. Money has always been a part of art, but it's not really a part of art. It's but part of the world, and the art lives in the world. Mo and money, that's why money plays a role in it. It's interesting because, like, money plays a part in food, um, but it, it doesn't play that big of a part in food 
in my mind. Because, in essence, I am the executor. I am executing it so people can have it. I know what it costs to run my business and what I need to execute my business. So I need to make sure that I put all those pieces together mm -hmm. so it works. But I don't know. But in the arts, it's, it's you know, it's much more uh, mercenary. For lack of a better term. No, yeah, no, I feel that. I feel because that. it's it's really it's unbelievable. I mean, uh, I have collectors come through here and they'll they're looking for names. Oh, you have a so and so. Oh, you have a so and so. But it's not even the ones that they don't recognize that they don't stop and think this is intriguing. <clears throat> what, what's going on here? No, they think about the name, the name, and therefore name. the market. Yeah, that's, it. that's it, it. You know, so that doesn't interest me. I I feel that like you know, it's is it the Eleven Madison Park? Is it the Alinea? Is it the Grace? Is it those things? There's other people too that are trying to uh, put their story out there. I need. To live surrounded by things that are a projection of my mind. You're sitting in my mind right now. It, this is an interesting mind. <laughs> so, if it's not making me think, it's not on the wall. Which is amazing. Like, in, in my mind, when I think about food, I, I'm surrounded by books. I'm surrounded by books that I think reflect my mind. And one day, an expression of my mind. It could be a fucking Tuesday. And like, I want to read Pierre Kaufman. And there's another day, I want to read Escoffier. And there's another day, I want to read someone more modern. And uh, my, my mind is very fucked up. So like, <laughs> you know, like the way that my mind thinks, whether it be modern and old school, is a reflection of the books that I so when, when I, what it is, it's promiscuous. But that's fine. Of course it's Promiscuity fine. Promiscuity is fine because it, exactly. it, it instigates thought and it right. instigates creativity, I think. Hmm. And like uh, oftentimes when I interview people, and I don't think that they really think about this, and it, it tells me a lot when they don't think about it. It's like, what do you read? What, what are you reading today? Like I know today... I read um, Dominique Crenn and I read Pierre Kaufman. There's very differing ideas and differing thought processes. But in essence, their food flows together. So when I ask someone, like, what do you read? Their, their response to me means a lot. Right. And in a world that it's all about like today, like what do I need right now? I need something right now. It's very immediate. Uh, people don't think about that very often, but I try to think about it as much as possible. And it's like, if you're reading things that I can vibe with, then I know that we, that you'll get the food process mm -hmm. long term. So uh, I feel like the same thing with food. Like when I look around and I see how your mind works, it's, fucked up and I like it like it makes a lot of sense to me um, but for some it may not make sense oh yeah no of course not right. but that's fine if we wanted to make sense with everyone then it would be a, a very boring world now that we've gone the places we've gone is there a poem we've gone so many places this is, is the, a very appropriate poem because yeah. are we I still reading it. are we still on a podcast right now? we're on a podcast right now and the well, question and the question is you know is, is there a poem given where this conversation has gone of Ricardo's that he thinks uh, I don't know why. But I'd, does... I'd love to know what Ricardo thinks about this whole conversation. I think it's been wonderful. I Good. Mean, That's all I really wanted. Yeah, yeah. That's all I wanted. I wanted you to feel like the conversation was but, wonderful. But, I, but I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I, the title of this poem might, might make you feel like the opposite. Oh, <laughs> fuck. But if we can, get come up to the, to yes, the microphone. Of course, I'm sorry. That's great, right there. The title of the poem is Famine. <laughs> okay, I feel that 100%. <laughs> Very appropriate for. <laughs> and it has an epigraph from a Yoruba song. Um, 
a traditional Yoruba, Yoruba, the, one of the great tribes of Nigeria, modern day Nigeria, from which many of the of our Afro-Cuban beliefs come mm-hmm. from, the Yoruas. And the epigraph reads, uh, it's a beautiful epigraph, the granary of heaven can never be full. And I dedicate this poem to a dear friend, Brian Hooper, who is a, an attorney who loves poetry and art and is a very good friend of mine. Wow, dear friends and attorneys, that's a strong word. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> my girlfriend's an attorney, too. So I, I like lawyers. They Sometimes. Yeah. So <laughs> the, ones I, the ones that are around me have been very, very good. Me, too. I, 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 I have very dear friends who are attorneys. It has to do with Genesis. Okay. okay. The end of Genesis is the Joseph story. He goes, he's sold by his brother's into slavery he's in egypt he winds up becoming the vizier second in command of of egypt after he he I, he reads pharaoh's dreams correctly pharaoh's been dreaming all these weird things among them the seven the seven lean cows and the seven you know fat cows and that's joseph saying that you know god is telling him there's a famine coming we have to be prepared and stuff like that and of course he succeeds in Egypt he becomes powerful and eventually he reconciles with his family and he brings his family to Egypt and that's the beginning of the of the Israelite uh, the Hebrew presence in Egypt which in Exodus then turns of course into flight from Egypt right Mm. 400 years later Mm. so famine has an epigraph from a Yoruba traditional song um the Yoruba being the most influential of the West African nations for the for the emergence of uh, of an Afro-Cuban culture and religious system. The granary of heaven can never be full. The cow pails with meat, bellies like a sail. The harvest blows. The cow pales with hunger, like worn cloth, flapping pins of light. Joseph plotted with weather and farrow to save a people on hunch and dream. He knew what the chronicler didn't, that the seven years of one coincide with the seven years of the other. Or who could dream that God's lucidity could be held in the baskets of caution. Hunger marries plenty. How God yearned to be felt in the pang as in the full purse. This Joseph knew. Gold is the mirror a lost heart earns. In it behold feasts river emptying into seas oblivion. Time is a place. The native asks, this Egypt, must I love it, famished, as when it golden stood? Belonging is a reflex. The exile says, Egypt full, a perfumed tide, empty, she is my child. Sand mocks grain only when there is no bread. When the granary's full, the two musics rhyme. Their glass songs sharpen the sun. I came upon this land as a child, yet sire enough of need to know the difference between journey and flight. And I came to love Egypt, knowing beaten soil and the deaf whip. The man now from what was cannot tell you what he loves more. The sand, the grain, the obelisks caught in dabs of onyx and silver on the Nile's impatient flow, or that Egypt fed as it hungered. Bam. Appropriate poem when I'm talking to a chef. (laughs) Appropriate poem when talking to a chef. (laughs) So with that, jeez, 
So yeah, thank you, Ricardo, for letting oh, us linger here for so long. It's been a pleasure. And I love talking to this man. <laughs> I, I, I I thought that you both might enjoy this. Yes, indeed. I I um, there's been several times in the last. I don't, how long have we been Two recording? Hours. Two hours. A couple hours. That I've been uh, fighting back tears, talking about my emotional connection to a uh, culture that we we in essence don't know like Ricardo does. There is. Uh, there's been several moments that I've thought about like the bigger journey for us and how I think that our words, and I say this several times, I think that what we do now means more in 10 years than it does today for my food, for what we talk about. And I know we talk a lot of shit because I do, I do talk a lot of shit. Um, I think it will resonate more in the future than maybe it does today because our culture will continue to dissolve into that American ideal more and more every day as they want us to assimilate to who they think we should be. And uh, the whole conversation has been enlightening, uh, emotional and it's been the first three quarters of it has been uh important i think on so many levels because it reaffirms things that we talk about that sometimes people just think that me and nick are just like we talk a fuck ton of shit because we do talk a fuck ton of shit um but when it comes to the ideal of who we are and our culture and our country, it's more than just that. And I think this reaffirms that. Well, of course. So I thank you for that. Um, I hope that people listen and I hope that people consume it and I hope they understand it. And I hope in Salina, Kansas, which we have people like five or six people that listen <laughs> uh, apparently in salina utah now people are listening That's right. as well um i hope they consume it and i think that in our journey as human beings the equation of like what you do today does that equal what the world is thinks is important which is monetary value it may not equate that but i think the long-term effect will be there and i think that's what we are sitting within yeah i'd just like to add one other thing and that is we talked a lot about cuba and our heritage and our duty to it a lot of americans almost all of them, think that Cuba is the past. It's a country stuck in the past and whatever. And I tell them that Cuba is a cautionary tale about what could be the future here. In the sense that Cuba was a modern culture. It had the highest standard of literacy and the lowest infant mortality in, in the Western world. Uh, certainly among them, um, it had uh, it had a higher standard of living than many European countries at the time in 1959. It had a higher standard of living than France, for instance, or Italy. It um, it was a modern society, highly unionized, uh, very diverse. It had 56 daily newspapers. It had television, radio all over the country. It was a very modern place. And totalitarianism turned it into a medieval squalor. Stone Age. Yes. In other words, it's proof that ideology can reverse the modern Mm. and everything we associate with it. Progress, freedom, diversity and many other things, that you can turn a modern society 
back hundreds and hundreds of years very mm-hmm. quickly. And that is something that most Americans, you know, they think this that they're bulletproof, that no matter who they support and vote for and applaud or condemn, that nothing has consequences, that they are floating in an ether, that the republic will survive anything. And of course, they're wrong, very wrong. And usually when you find out you're wrong, it's too late to do anything about it. Um, Cuba is a cautionary tale. I don't want people to keep thinking of it as something that happened and doesn't doesn't have any relevance to us. It does. It is a very important lesson that has been lost on just about everybody in this country. And we're here to help that culture keep growing here in exile. But that's because that's all we've got left. It would have been much more interesting if we had had this conversation in a free Havana. Mm. But maybe we wouldn't have needed this conversation in a free Havana. No, it would have been a different conversation (laughs) in a free Havana. Yes. So we should embrace our fate it is a fate that is lonely and bewildering, but deepening, and that has given us a relevance that very few in a society that is driven by pleasure and frivolity will ever experience. And I, in that sense, I am I'm grateful that I am in that in this position, mm. as as difficult as it often is. I wouldn't change it for the world. Well, I think that's. Um, I, I think we can end on that. <coughs> okay. There's really not not much more I can add to that. All right, boom. <laughs>